everyone can improvise. It's not something you're born with, like, oh, wow, that's so great, you can just improvise. Like, if I improvise and somebody says that to me, like, oh, you're so talented. I'm like, no, not really. I mean, thanks, but I practiced. Welcome to the Piano Sensei Way. I'm your host, Clinton Pratt, and I'm here to help you master the art of running a successful piano teaching studio. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about improvisation for beginners, how to teach beginners improvisation, even from the very first lesson. Maybe you're a teacher who improvises a little bit, or maybe not at all, and that's okay and you want to incorporate something like this with your students, but you're not sure how, or maybe even if you don't really improvise, this will still help you because we're going to talk about um, just how to start from the very beginning without even needing to know chords and keys and scales and all that. And we're going to talk about the benefits, why everybody should improvise and why it helps. And I'm going to give you five tips on how to start and do it with beginners. So let's dive in. Now, first, just a little bit about my story as it relates to improv. I didn't really do too much as a child growing up playing the piano, learning the piano, although I did sort of, you know, mess around a bit on the piano and I guess make up my own things or just sort of doodle around, but nothing serious. I also played piano in church as a child. I grew up in a small church and um, sometimes the pianist couldn't play. And so they they were like, hey, Clinton, just get up there. Uh, So, you know, I learned to sort of fake it playing hymns or, you know, a chord chart from a, a more popular style. And then, you know, in college and after, I also played a lot of church gigs. So I could play by chords and improvise, you know, but it was all sort of chord-based, if you know what I mean. So, um, for example, because I'm sitting here right here at the piano, you know, let's say there was a, a song and it was like G, E minor, C, D, or something. So... Right. And so, you know, it's just kind of the basic, like, pianist, church pianist way of improvising. Like, oh, yeah, I can you know, doodle on G and then E minor, whatever. Um, and then I also took some jazz classes and workshops. I went to a Jamie Ebersold training week. It was like a week long. So that was definitely a different approach, but it was also still very chord and scale based, right? It was like, what chord are you playing? Oh, you're playing a, um, you know, C augmented, sharp nine, and so you're going to use this scale and the right hand to improvise and focus on the thirds and the sevenths and all this stuff. So it's still kind of advanced and based on chords and scales, which I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but with beginners, they don't know chords and scales, right? So... Anyway, after some years of teaching piano, I noticed little short improv activities in method books and things, and I thought, okay, well, that's this is kind of interesting. And then I saw Forrest Kinney at a workshop, and the light bulb went off. You can improvise from the beginning. He even took a volunteer from the audience, or actually, I think he had a, a student who had never improvised before, you know, and he just had them play some black keys and he played along with them and he was very supportive and encouraging and it was beautiful music and I thought, well, of course, I sh- should be doing this with everybody. So that's the thing we want to do. Is you don't have to know anything about chords, ski- keys, skis. You don't have to know anything about skis either. Chords, keys, scales, reading music. You don't even have to read it, right? And so I became dedicated to helping my students improvise even from the very beginning And I also like helping teachers improvise and teach improvisation. And I've done this as a workshop at different 
conferences. And everybody loves it, of course, because this is the Piano Sensei way. <laughs> but no. Um, so yeah, I just, I want to help more people do this because, you know, well, we'll talk about the benefits. So why should people improvise? It, well, if you think about it, music is a language. So we should be able to speak music on the spot. Right? I mean, think about a, a spoken language. You learn to speak by imitating others, and then you start creating your own sounds and phrases and sentences. So small children improvise all the time with speaking, right? Then we learn to read later, and then we learn to write even later than that. So why is music teaching sometimes the other way around? Like, you can't play until you can read it. I mean, that's kind of the approach that a lot of teachers do, or, you know, I, I think it is. Or at least it's mostly, you know, like, okay, yes, here, play some black keys. Okay, now here's the staff, and, you know, play two, three, four on on these three black keys and follow along. And I mean, that's, that's still reading. So and it's kind of weird to me, like that we would try to get students to read it off of the page in order to make music. When that's not how we do with language, we speak and make the sounds first, then we read it later. Imagine if you said to children as they were learning to speak when they were, you know, two, three years old, I don't know. I don't have kids. So and I don't remember that stage in my life, but however old that is, um, what if we told them, nope, shh, you can't speak. You can't talk until you can read it. Okay, so let's learn to read. Well, that's going to be a while. Okay, so let them just make the sounds and form their phrases and sentences and everything. And that's the same with music. Don't worry about the reading. Just get them to speak music. Make music. Create the sounds. It might be awkward at first. That's okay. So is talking. I was like, what are you saying? Only your mom can understand you. Okay. So that's the that's really the main reason, I think, is just if you're a musician or if you're going to become a musician, you need to speak music. It's interesting to me, too, how many teachers, piano teachers, can't improvise. I'm not judging anyone, but it's just an observation. Okay, if you're a musician and you teach piano, just play something. And then, you know, some teachers get terrified, like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't just sit down and play something. I need my sheet music. Well, why can't you? I mean, if you speak English, can't you just, like, say something? Or do you have to read it from a script? All right. Now, some specific musical benefits from improvising. It helps with a steady beat. And we'll get into the details in a second, but I've noticed this with all my students. It really helps the music flow, even when they're playing other things and not improvising. Um, there's freedom and exploration. It's fun. It can be funny. Okay, if you hit a wrong note, quote unquote, it's not really a long note, wrong notes, but you know, it can sound funny and it can just bring humor. Um, it's creative, obviously. It promotes understanding. And actually, it can help facilitate other concepts. And we'll probably do this in a future episode. But improvisation can help with practicing and sight reading and all kinds of things. Okay, now, I also strongly believe that everyone can improvise. It's not something you're born with. Like, oh, wow, that's so great. You can just improvise. Okay. Like if I improvise and somebody will, somebody says that to me, like, oh, you're so talented. I'm like, no, not really. I mean, thanks, but I practiced. <laughs> okay. So it's sort of an insult to me when, when someone says I'm talented <laughs> because although I appreciate the sentiment, um, no, I didn't come out of the womb improvising. I practiced doing it. So I worked hard. So I'd rather you say, wow, you've really worked hard on your skill. And then I would say, thank you. Um, now you already do improvise a lot in life in things like we talked about speaking. 
maybe cooking. Okay, what if you don't have something in a recipe? You improvise. Or maybe you're driving, your GPS goes out and there's a traffic jam. You just, hey, let's go this way and then whatever. You improvise. So that's what we do. All right. Now to get into more specifics, how to actually teach improv to beginners, doing it from the beginning. So I'll give you five tips and then we'll go into them in detail. Number one, start now, start soon. Number two, start easy. Number three, black keys. Number four, copy, going back and forth. My turn, your turn. And number five, accompany or accompaniment. All right, so we're going to go through these. Number one is start now, start soon. Now, what do I mean? Well, I just mean start right now, start soon, now, okay? It's really obvious, but um, with your students, maybe even later today, I don't know what time it is that you're listening to this, start now, just do it right now, okay? Don't wait until you have some plan and you've thought about it a lot, just do it, just start. Number two is start easy. Why? Because if it's easy, then it flows easier. Isn't this how we want to help our students practice for anything? Is we want it to be easy. Think about when you're playing something that's easy. Doesn't the music flow? Isn't it more musical when it's easy? Because you're not stressed about it. You're not worried. You're not thinking about the fingering and stumbling and, you know, all in your mind and everything. We want an easy flow. So it's the same with improv. Start easy. For example, it could just be one note. Let's just improvise on one note. You might say that's not an improvisation. Well, yeah, it is because you can do different rhythms. You can do loud or quiet. You can do different articulations. You can have all kinds of different moods and sounds with just one note. I like to do this demonstration. I'll try to emulate it here now. But I like to do it in workshops. I'll have a volunteer come up and just give them a note. Here, you're going to play this note. And I'll point it to, and, you know, <laughs> that's all I have to do is just play that one note, however you want to do it. And then I'll accompany on the lower end of the keyboard. Um, so I might start and I'll say, you know, come in whenever you like. Okay, so I was I was kind of being the student and the teacher, but that one note is just, doo, 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 you know, however they want to do it, and then you can change the mood or the style too, you know. You know, whatever, but it's just a way to sort of get the juices flowing, and given parameters, then it's actually easier to express and be free. Maybe it seem, that seems opposite, but you know, if I just said make something up, you're kind of like, uh, I have no idea. There's 88 keys. I've got 10 fingers. Uh, like, what am I going to do? But hey, just play one note. So it's, it's limited with parameters, but then you're able to freely express because it's like just easier to digest, if that makes sense. And you're not overwhelmed. Okay, now besides just one note, um, you could also do things based on a picture or an idea. And I like to do this in group classes or even in private lessons, is just have some pictures or images. And then um, you try to improvise what the picture is. Or maybe I'll start and the student has to guess. Okay, so there'll be like a picture of horses running and like a hummingbird. 
and a waterfall or something and I go, okay, what's this? Horses! Okay, what's this one? Like a hummingbird, you know? So then we're like, oh, well, how did you know that, right? And so then we talk about different elements like, was it fast or slow? Was it loud or quiet? And was it high or low? So then you can flip it around and you can ask the students, okay, so now I want you to play. And maybe you show them a picture of, um, I don't know, the hummingbird. And they say, well, I don't know what to play. And it's like, okay, well, is it going to be high or low? And hopefully they'll say, okay, it's up high. All right, is it going to be fast or slow? Fast, okay, because the wings are flapping fast. They might say slow, I don't know. And then is it going to be loud or quiet? Probably quiet. So we're going to play high, fast, and quiet. So I don't care what notes they are, what keys they are, what fingers, which hands, whatever. It's just... Whatever, right? Just getting them playing. What were the, what were the horses? Well, that was low, fast, and loud. Right? Um, yeah. Now, some things might fit multiple things. Like, um, I don't know, you might have like a mountain scene. So, like, is that loud or quiet? Like these big majestic mountains. You know, maybe it's loud, but maybe it's quiet because it's serene. You know, I don't know. There's no right answer, but it's just... To, think um, also if something is big like a mountain scene it's then it's not really high or low you want to do both because if you think about the physical space right big is your hands far apart so you have okay that was a little atonal sounding but that's okay who cares um, right, and so you have one hand low, one hand high, it gives the impression of something being big. Conversely, if something is small, then you stay close together, right? Like the hummingbird. You stay close. You probably wouldn't do... Right, because that's kind of like taking up a lot of space. All right, so that's the idea is high or low, loud or quiet, fast or slow. If you can figure out those then you get a pretty good idea of what the picture or the idea would be or the story okay so that was number two start easy right we're not even talking about keys chords scales we're not reading notes off the sheet music none of that step number three black keys okay i'm sure you're all well aware it's nice to improvise on black keys because it's the pentatonic scale And kind of like none of them sound like a wrong note because there's no half steps. It's kind of ambiguous. It floats around. It's beautiful. Um, lots of folk melodies from all around the world use pentatonic. So again, you could use just one finger on the black keys or, you know, like a braced finger for beginners. You can just do two black keys. You just say, we're just going to play these two black keys. Maybe they'll play both at once. Right? And so you're going to play an accompaniment. They're going to play. Or whatever. Um, three black keys. Maybe five black keys. I like to do the thumb on the first set of two. So C sharp or D flat. So you go one, two, three, four, five. That sh shape sort of fits nicely. Um... Of course, you can do any black keys, but you can just start with, um, you know, just one or just two. Remember, start easy. You want parameters so that you're free to explore. So that's step or tip three, black keys. Tip four is copy, or otherwise known as back and forth, or my turn, your turn. You can also think of it as question and answer. So I do this a lot of a lot of times. That's how we even start um, with improv. We, we might not even start with improv 
the very first thing like, hey, now we're going to improv because that's scary. I might just start with copy what I play. And then they play. Right. And they can watch. It's not like an ear test, although you could make it into a game too. Of, okay, don't watch my hand and then see if you can copy. So you're just copying. They're just copying what you're playing. Also, because that's, that's, yeah, it's not as intimidating because they're not really making anything up. They're just copying. But then you can say, okay, we're still going to use three black keys. Copy my rhythm. Not necessarily the notes. So I might go. And they play. Or something like that. Now, they might want to copy the notes or try to match it. In that case, I could even just play a drum or tap tap my hands or tap my lap or something and say, hey, I want you to copy this rhythm, but use your um, fingers on the black keys to play that same rhythm. So I might, on the drum or clap, I might go, bum, 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 your turn. My turn, bum, 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 bum. Etc. So yeah, a lot of times I start with a drum or clapping just so that they're only hearing a rhythm and then they're playing that on black keys. And then I'll say, now I'm going to give you a rhythm, but I'm going to play it on the piano as well. So we might have different notes, but just copy my rhythm. Your turn. Okay, so going, going back and forth. My turn, your turn. Then um, don't copy my rhythm. Okay, so now it's more actual improving, you know, improvising what notes and rhythms to play. But instead of saying, now just make up the whole thing on your own, you know, that's scary. Just say, no, you don't have to copy my rhythm. Okay, my turn first. Your turn. My turn. Okay, and usually I'm accompanying as well, which is tip five, so we'll get to that too, but you know, I might go. Your turn. My turn. Your turn. My turn. And um, I'll give you these um, chord progressions and harmonies that I'm using. Um, just click the link in the show notes, and I've got all these um, printed out with some instructions for you. You can also go to thepianosenseiway.com and find the episode. Okay, so that's copy, back and forth, my turn, your turn. Now, I really love this for many reasons, but my favorite is it helps establish a sense of phrasing. And you know the form and the structure. Dun da 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 dum bum bum. Your turn. Dun do 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 do. You know, like it's it just sort of sets you up for phrases. So then you can still do like back and forth or question and answer, but just you, just one person, right? So it's instead of my turn, your turn. It's your turn, your turn. <laughs> Okay, so the idea is that you play something and then something else and then something else and then right so it helps establish whatever it is like oh we're doing every eight beats or four beats or a measure or two measures and again we're not necessarily talking about any of that that comes later but it helps develop that in the future, they're already set up for that. And it's also helpful to stop saying my turn and your turn and see if they know when it's their turn, right? So you'll play, okay, good, let's keep going. My turn first. Right, and leave, let, the, let them take it over. All right, tip five. A company.
Now, there's many reasons for this as well, but the main thing is it provides support, so they're not alone. Okay, if you just say, okay, play black keys, go ahead, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm watching. <laughs> okay, and so it's a little intimidating. So always play with your students. It doesn't even have to be one, two, ready, go. You can just say, I'm gonna start playing and you can play some black keys whenever you're ready. Right, it's fine. Um, another reason I like to accompany is it sounds better. <laughs> okay, so it might, might be kind of obvious, but it's more interesting. It's a more rich texture. Okay, and again, this prepares them for the future too because they're hearing harmonies, they're hearing different things. There's a whole um, atmosphere and everything. And, you know, you can vary your accompaniment infinite ways, right? The speed, the style, fast, slow, you know, different ranges, different rhythms, different patterns, etc. And also the idea with accompanying is they can eventually accompany themselves, right? They can just play a left-hand bass note. And then maybe eventually that becomes fifths and maybe chords and then arpeggiations or some other kind of pattern. Sometimes I even do this with a beginning student in the first lesson, depending on their age and their, you know, ability right there in the moment. If we've already sort of done some right hand, I'll show them a bass note for the left hand. I'll just say, play this note. Now play this one. Good. And just, you know, we'll go back and forth and I'll tell you when to change. And change. Okay, so I'm like teaching them a chord progression, really, but it's just a bass note by rote. And then, then okay, now you try both hands. What did you do with your right hand, do you remember? It's like, oh, I need black keys. So they just play this one note in the left hand, F sharp, by the way, G flat. And then they play something in the right hand. Now change your left hand. Etc. Okay, so they can accompany themselves. The one note can eventually become fifths. It could be broken fifths. It could be in a different range. It could be a steady beat. Right? It could be. It could be a chord. different textures so that's another great thing is we'll do these in, in future episodes of how these can be expanded later but this is just for beginners so you know start simple start easy start now all right so we're about finished but i'll just um, go through some of those accompaniments that you can use and again you can just download this um, resource if you want it for free so the main one i was doing there was G flat and E flat minor, just back and forth for a while. And then when that gets old, then we go to the bridge, C flat, and then D flat, back to the beginning. Or you can think of it as one and six, back and forth, and then four, five. Okay. Another one I like is, this is a more sort of continuous cycle and a little ambiguous, but I like it. Ambiguous sounding, like, ooh, is it major or minor? Because you start on E flat minor, then G flat major, B flat minor, D flat major, back to the beginning. So E flat minor, G flat. Okay, 
way. So you can think of that as like six, one, three, five, if you're in major, or one, three, what is this one? <laughs> five, seven. And then the other one that I like is sort of a longer cycle. It goes through the circle of fifths, circle of fourths a little bit. It's basically one, four, three, six, two, five, one. So three, six, two, five, one goes around the circle of fifths. But we start off with one, four. You could do one, four, seven, three, six, two, five, one, and just do the whole cycle. So G flat. <laughs> C flat, B flat minor, E flat minor, A flat minor, D flat, seven, G flat. So again, G flat, C flat, B flat minor, E flat minor, A flat minor, D flat seven. you can do all kinds of variations what's nice with this one too is if you make every chord into a seventh chord diatonic seventh so it'd be g flat major seventh c flat major seventh some accompaniments for you hopefully that's helpful and i think that wraps it up for the teaching beginners improv episode i hope that was helpful let me know if you have questions or comments i would love to hear from you go to the piano sensei way make sure you're subscribed so that you get notified when we're doing new episodes and also there is a video version which maybe you already know because maybe you're watching this so, duh. But if you're just listening to this on Apple or Overcast or Spotify or whatever, um, there's a video version. Sometimes I put things up on the screen as well. But for this one, it's mostly just me sitting here talking so you can look at my beautiful face. And, uh, yeah. So, thanks for joining, and I will see you next time. I'm Clinton, your piano sensei. Take care. <laughs>